Good afternoon and good morning, everyone across the world. Welcome to the Create a Trademark Seminar. The Create a Trademark Seminar is a new set of seminars launched this year. For those who are new to us, Create is a three research council founded center initially for copyright research at the University of Glasgow, UK. But increasingly, many of us are working in the trademark field, digital platform, and competition law and relevant fields. The focus of this seminar will be in line with ongoing research interests at CREATE. One is a trademark history hosted by my colleague, Dr. Elena Cooper. And the other one is innovative methodologies in contemporary trademark law, chaired by me, Dan McGranta, Creative Research Administrator, uh, she coordinates both seminars. Two weeks ago, we were delighted to open with the first trademark history seminar presented by Dr. Jennifer Davis from University of Cambridge. And it is with great pleasure today, we welcome four fabulous speakers from New York University to present their new research investigating the rule of consumer uncertainty in trademark law with a focus on experimental methods. The people they present today may be well known, but we have asked them to take it in a new way, the empirical methods. Our four speakers have interdisciplinary backgrounds across IP law and marketing. Professor Barton Bibi, uh, he's an older friend of CREATE. He gave a public lecture here back in 2016 when CREATE Center hosted the annual conference of ISHTIP. He specialized in the doctrinal, empirical, and culture analysis of IP law. He will set out the problem that the research tries to address and how the experiment further expose the problem and attempt to solve it. Professor Chris Sprigman is a professor in IP law and creativity. His research focuses on how the legal rules affect innovation and the deployment of new technologies. Today, he will present a variety of experimental programs he has done. Professor Royal Germano is an expert in both law and international relations. His research focuses on the topics like dream, the DREAM Act, IP rights, judicial ideology, etc. Today, he will discuss the mechanics of running online experimental surveys. Lastly, Professor June Steko is a professor of marketing. His research interests cover marketing research, branding strategy, managerial decision process and methodologies for measuring consumer performance and behaviors. He will join the conversation in the Q&A session. So we will hold all questions and conversations at a section of Q&A um, for 20 minutes. We will have the presentation together for 35 minutes at the beginning. And if you have questions during the Q&A, please raise your hand through the reaction button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, so I think it's a time. Uh, so Burton, would you want to start your presentation? Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me begin uh, by thanking Sharon and uh, Elena and everyone at CREATE on our behalf for inviting us to participate in this seminar series. It's quite a privilege and also for scheduling it in such a way that we could all four of us join up. Um, we are actually scattered around the world at the moment. I'm not in New York City. And so it's sort of super cool space travel, I think that we're able to uh, join you all and have this uh, discussion. So um, our agenda is shown here on this slide and Sharen already gave you, I think a good uh, understanding of how we'll proceed. I'll first talk for about 10, maybe 15 minutes at the most about our most recent project. Uh, which is under the title Consumer Uncertainty and Trademark Law and Experimental Investigation. And I'll mention some of the highlights of that project, just so you have a sense, uh, almost like as an anchor of uh, one of these experimental projects that we're currently uh, doing. And this project extends methodologically uh, in general terms from a previous project we did on trademark dolution that came out in uh, UChicago Law Review 
um, a couple of years ago. But I won't spend too much time on this project because as Create, people at Create said, it might be of greater interest to those joining uh, the seminar to hear more about the methodological um, tips we have or the empirical methods we've used uh, in these experiments. So especially in that connection, I'll then turn things over to Chris, who will talk about previous experimental projects he's engaged in. And he's the perfect person to do it because he's been doing it since like before it was cool and uh, really knows how this stuff works. And then Roy uh, will talk about the mechanics of how actually practically to conduct the kind of work that I'll be des describing and Chris also will be describing. And then Joel batting forth in the cleanup position uh, will correct all of my misstatements uh, and otherwise um, help with question and answers um, and uh, hopefully uh, what we present will, will be interesting to you and, and you're most welcome to ask whatever questions uh, you may have. So let me then uh, get started with the, uh, this example project, which is the paper we're currently uh, working on forthcoming in Emory sometime by the end of this uh, calendar year. So as you may know, survey evidence is widely used in trademark litigation in the United States, especially in major well-funded trademark litigation, but it's controversial. Uh, it's prone, uh, it, it, is, it has been accused of being prone to expert manipulation and judges are occasionally, I might even say personally, often wary of survey evidence in trademark litigation. Not so wary, not nearly as wary as in the UK with, I don't know if you know, the Whitford guidelines and that sort of thing. Um, but still judges are you know, suspicious of it. Um, and in this project, we sought to focus on one particular problem in consumer survey evidence and trademark litigation, and that is the problem of respondent uncertainty um, in how consumers answer. This slide is just is, uh, is portraying to you. Uh, there are a bunch of different survey formats in American trademark litigation for various factual uh, questions. But all of them use what is basically a three answer forced choice method. Um, basically, yes, no, or unsure are the three uh, answers. Um, I myself might lazily uh, think of these as basically binary formats because uh, we very rarely get uh, people saying unsure, don't know, no opinion. And instead, it's just thumbs up or, or thumbs down as to whatever question uh, the person uh, is being asked. Um, but we think um, this is, we, we hypothesized that this was uh, limiting the kind of information that these surveys could give to finders of fact, especially in uh, analyzing the degree of uncertainty that consumers might have in answering these questions. Uh, for example, by, you know, using a Likert scale, Likert scale sort of uh, method along the lines of definitely, you know, very likely, somewhat likely, don't know. Because seven point uh, scale. So to make a long story very short, we thought let's use a Likert scale uh, or variations on it and see what we get as far as uh, survey results. So I will present to you one of the three survey experiment groups of experiments we ran, one group of experiments that we ran. Uh, this sort of simplest to describe in the amount of time we have. But if you're curious, we can talk about the other two uh, as well. So here is an example of a traditional likelihood of confusion survey in the US called the Squirt uh, survey format after this Squirt v. case in 1980. The format in essence presents the marks side by side or one after another, and then asks a series of questions uh, of the survey respondent. We based our experimental stimuli on the facts of a recent case involving these two brands of flavored vodka. You can see, and this is the pucker is the junior user, the senior user sued the junior user for infringement of this uh, device. Um, and as I said, in essence, we'd show the photo and then we'd ask some questions. Um, the, uh, and the main question, yeah, I'll just feature it here, but we'll have it on the next slide. Where I left off was if we get a response of 20 to 25 percent of respondents answering same, then that's typically accepted by courts as pretty good evidence of a likelihood of confusion. There's a more behind that statement, uh, but we could leave it. Uh, we can pursue that a little bit more in question and answer. Um, with this stimulus, 
we then asked them, uh, Group A survey respondents, this basic squared question, do you believe these products are put out by the same company or by different companies? And here on this slide, you can see the answer we got. 24.5% said that they thought the uh, products were put out by the same company. 8.8% said, don't know, not sure. 66.7 different companies. That's, uh, that's how SCORE proceeds. What we did then is we added a follow-up question. This was new to the SCORE uh, format. Uh, the follow-up question was, how likely do you think it is that these products are put out by the same company for those who answer the same company or by different companies for those who answer a different company? And look at the results we got. Um, the, uh, you'll see here suddenly that of those who said same company, only two uh, of the 24.5% who said same company, 2% were ultimately actually saying they were definitely sure of that. 13.7, um, very likely, same company. Ultimately, then the court would be presented with 15.7% uh, of uh, the population of consumers being confused rather than 24.5%, um, much lower, substantially lower than um, uh, and, and below the threshold for confusion. Also charming were the 2% who said, actually, you know, I said same before, but I was just guessing. Um, and the 8.8% who said, I said different before, but I was uh, just guessing. Um, we thought this was uh, quite interesting um, and uh, I think gave us um, incentive to keep pursuing uh, the issue of uncertainty in further experiments. Group B, we asked, uh, we went straight to the Likert scale. And you can see the answer set that we presented uh, to them, um, the seven point answer set. And here again, we got lower than 25% confusion. This time it was 19.2% confusion, also below uh, the standard threshold for um, a finding of infringement um, in a standard trademark litigation uh, case. So um, what I love about this project, and that's just a taste of it, we basically use the same methods with respect to the Teflon survey for generism and the uh, um, ever-ready survey for likelihood of confusion, which is a bit more involved of a survey. For, uh, speaking for myself, they're not rocket science in the survey method. And that slight modification gave us a massive amount of new and important information uh, that would be uh, important, both in terms of the litigation, uh, specific litigation, and also trademark policy more generally. But to make a long story short, and this is my last slide, um, in essence, in terms of implications, we urge uh, courts to demand, or maybe I'm overstating it there, but in any case, we support the adoption of this different survey uh, method that tests for uncertainty, and we further um, call for a standard in which a court should find a relevant fact only when a threshold proportion of consumers believe it to be substantially likely, as shown by that survey. So it's not enough to say 20% of consumers blurted out uh, that they thought it was the same company, if in the follow-up question we find that some, you know, half of them weren't really sure if it was the same company. We would want to hear that they definitely think it's the same company or very likely the same company. We think this is consistent with the evidentiary burdens in uh, American as well as, for that matter, UK materiality in uh, trademark law. What is that? Well, in American false advertising law, in order for the plaintiff to prevail, the plaintiff has to, sh has to show that the false advertising statement was material to a consumer's decision to purchase, um, that it actually affected the decision to purchase. Trademark law in the US does not have that requirement that false advertising law has, but we uh, propose that it would be a good requirement to have in trademark law. And this survey method, especially insisting on very likely or definitely might push us towards something like a materiality requirement. Final point I'll make is that um, better information about the degree of consumer certainty might help us to tailor better remedies when courts do find infringement. Uh, courts might find in some situations where there's actually not a high proportion who are definitely confused. Uh, courts might say, well, just a disclaimer might disabuse consumers of confusion or a slight change in the defendant's trademark uh, might be enough. So again, that's just an example of an experimental project and just one highlight from that project. But now in the, in the interest of methodology and sort of generalizing um, this project, I'll turn things over to Chris to talk about his, his past projects.
Thanks, Barton. And, and, and I really appreciate um, the chance to, to talk at this, um, at this presentation about some of the, some of the literature um, that's been developed in the experimental um, uh, a part of IP empiricism over the last 10 years or so. Um, so this trademark project that Barton just talked about, um, I think is part of a bigger effort, which is you know growing and, and what the people at Create have quite a bit to do with this, its growth, a bigger effort to provide some rigor, some empirical rigor to the um, basically the presumptions that underlie a lot of intellectual property law, um, patent law, but also particularly copyright and trademark law. Um, so I, with a number of co-authors, have been trying, um, uh, and others have been trying to, to pick away at some of these presumptions and try to figure out if they can be validated empirically or not. Um, so let me just talk about a, a line of research that <clears throat> maybe illustrates um, some of the approaches, some of the problems that have been dealt with and that remain kind of to be just uh, investigated further. So <clears throat> I want to talk about first the endowment effect and something called the creativity effect. So uh, there was a couple of papers that I did with Chris Bacafusco early on um, uh, that got at a pretty basic question, which was um, whether transactions in the kinds of goods that are covered by copyright are subject to endowment effects. Um, why would that matter? Well, copyright is based on a, a kind of market philosophy. We incentivize people to create works, which we then expect to be transacted over in a market. And we think basically that this is an efficient mechanism for um, you know, in, incentivizing the creation of new art and culture and then distributing it. One of the potential problems with that model is <clears throat> if the distribution of these works in market transactions is less efficient than we suspect, it could be less efficient than we suspect if um, the holders of rights, so copyright holders um, in poems or photographs or uh, movies, don't value their works in the way a kind of rational market participant would, but in fact, their ownership of these works um, contributes to some kind of um, idiosyncratic valuation. So go, going back up more than a quarter century now, there were some early experiments with tangible products like coffee mugs, where um, students are you know, paired up and they sit next to each other and one of each pair gets a coffee mug. And you know the question is asked, how much would you accept to transfer that coffee mug to the student sitting next to you? And then the student sitting next to them is asked, how much would you pay? So the coffee mug is worth about five bucks. The, 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 the would-be buyers are willing to pay about five bucks. And it turns out that the, the people who are given the coffee mug want seven, right? There's something going on. It's a bit mysterious, but their valuation of the mug is, is raised in a sense, heightened by the fact that they own it. There's some, there's some attachment. Um, maybe there's loss aversion going on. So they, they anticipate the regret over transferring a mug that they've come to like in the short term, they've owned it. Um, uh, maybe there's some kind of identification of property with self. Um, there, there's a number of mechanisms that have been proposed and tested. None of them have been uh, either ruled out or ruled in, but, but there's something going on here. Now, Chris and I, when we started thinking about this, we thought, well, you know, all these experiments are mugs and movie tickets and, um, you know, tangible goods. Uh, what if we did it with an intangible good, right? A, 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 a non-rival good, like a poem or um, a painting. Um, so the, we, we modeled those transactions basically in the first two papers we did, uh, valuing intellectual property experiment, which was about poems, and the creativity effect, which was about paintings. We actually had haiku writing contests, and then we had painting contests, um, and we auctioned these paintings. But actually, we didn't auction the paintings itself. We auctioned basically the right to receive the proceeds from the sale of the painting. Um, and what we found was actually endowment effects do extend to intangible goods like paintings um, or you know, the, the rights in the painting, because we weren't auctioning the painting itself, but the right basically to collect the money. Um, and in fact, um, for, for owners, um, the, 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 the endowment effect was significant, but for the actual authors, if the, if the person being you know, uh, examined in the transaction was an author and not a mere owner, um, the endowment effect was really much more significant. Um, there was a bigger gap 
between willingness to sell the potential you know, income from the painting, for example, and willingness to pay to buy that potential income from the painting. Um, this, we, this extra increment we, we call the creativity effect. And th this uh, paper uh, suggests that this is a special um, uh, behavioral quirk that attaches not just to the ownership of, of creative property, but to the creation of that property. Um, so there, you know, we, we, we had a line of research that um, begins to suggest that this model of kind of incentive and relying on markets or distribution is going to be subject to some of the same um, problems that uh, attend markets in real property or personal property. And in fact, some special problems that relate to creativity, maybe the extra emotional investment, the extra labor investment that um, leads to greater identification of creators with what they've owned and potentially greater anticipated regret. Um, could we have the next slide? So <clears throat> Chris and I uh, started working with other people, uh, uh, Zach Burns, um, Jeannie Fromer, um, investigating um, IP incentives. And here we, were, we weren't looking at markets necessarily, but whether incentives to create um, tested out in the way um, that the, 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 the kind of catechism of IP suggests that they do. So the first thing we looked at was rights of attribution. And we ha had a photography contest and we, we had um, different um, uh, versions of the photography contest where sometimes um, creators got a right of attribution, sometimes they didn't, and we measured how much they basically were uh, willing to accept to transfer those rights to others. It turns out that yes, creators do value the right of attribution, but the, the value that they place on the right of attribution is highly endogenous on whether attribution is the default right or not. So if the law gives you attribution as the default right, you tend to value it as a creator. If the law doesn't, you tend not to. Um, so this is an interesting example of you know, a market not basically placing a value on a right absent kind of the pre-decision about ownership. Um, and that suggests that you know, in a sense, this preference is endogenous on the law. We next looked at the question whether incentives structured like copyright, in other words, relatively easy to get, the originality requirement is low, but um, uh, you know, competing in a market with a lot of other um, relatively easy to get rights, whether incentive structured like that or like patent, relatively hard to get, right? But once you've invested and created a, a product that is novel, an invention that is novel, you're, you're, you're competing with relatively few entrants in all likelihood in the market, whether copyright style or patent style incentives do a better job of incentivizing creativity, um, we had a paper in the Texas Law Review, which basically tested this out with a, with a bunch of um, games that people played under copyright-like or patent-like rules. And what we found is the copyright-like incentives don't seem to have much effect on performance. If we crank them up, people basically did about the same. Um, patent-like incentives appear to do more. So if we gave people patent-like incentives, they seem to perform better in the game than if we gave them copyright -like incentives or no incentives at all. And th those differences were significant. So the structure of incentives may matter to performance. Um, can we have a, the next slide? Sorry, next slide. Okay. Um, we, we started looking now at, and others have looked at, um, uh, Martin Brueggemann and a, a team have looked at um, whether IP incentives, oops, one back. Okay, there we go. Whether sorry, IP sorry, sorry. sorry, Martin? Uh, it seems to be on a delay, sorry to interrupt. No, no worries at all. Whether IP incentives affect people's decisions, whether to build on others' work or start creating from scratch. And both our um, paper and the Brueggemann et al. paper suggests that actually IP rights don't perform in the way that they've been advertised with respect to sequential innovation. The choice to borrow from others or to start fresh seems to depend more in our study on the perceived difficulty of innovation 
facing a particular creator and not the IP incentives on offer. We, we further suggest, our, our results suggest that creators employ a set of heuristics to make this assessment about the difficulty of innovation. And sometimes these heuristics lead them astray. The Brueggemann et al. paper is complementary. They say that IP rights can get in the way of sequential innovation by pushing second stage innovators to avoid borrowing. We found that too, at the margins, you get somewhat less borrowing if you really crank up IP incentives, but you have to crank them up pretty far. It's not a smooth dose response curve, but at very high levels of protection, IP rights can push second stage innovators to avoid borrowing even when borrowing is efficient. In, in favor of exploiting less valuable start from scratch innovation paths. Um, so those two papers are complementary. Now, you know, I've talked about these papers, I could talk about a bunch of others, but, but I have to say, even though there's been quite a bit of work produced now, um, the, the basic questions in IP law that are amenable to empirical research in copyright and trademark especially, remain to be explored. There's a ton of work to do here. I'm at a conference in Munich, which is, um, you know, the European law and economics folks getting together. And, you know, it's some, there's some work going on there that's very valuable, but th there, there's a whole, you know, a couple of generations worth of work to do left. So, so if, I, um, if I had any effect on you, I hope it will be to show you that there's, there's um, fruitful work that has been done, but there's so much more low hanging fruit to, 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 to be plucked. And I'll stop there, hand it over to Roy. Great, hey, thanks, Chris. Um, I'm just going to talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of how we run our experiments when we do them online. Um, I'll talk about where we recruit the subjects, how we screen out the ineligible subjects, how we randomly assign the eligible subjects to treatment and control groups, varying our instrument by group assignment, and then I'll wrap up with the discussion of uh, piloting and, and quality checks. So uh, we for the, the two projects that Barton mentioned on dilution and confusion, we have recruited our subjects through a service called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, this is a service uh, provided by Amazon where uh, people can go online <clears throat> and mention that you have an online job for somebody to do or a survey. And there are people out there that are uh, willing to, to do the job or participate in the survey. Um, we post these ads on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and then uh, we will include a link that sends uh, people who respond to a survey that we create in an online software called Qualtrics, which is a very flexible way to conduct surveys and also online experiments. Um, if you're familiar with Mechanical Turk, you've probably heard of some of these advantages and disadvantages, but um, the, the main advantages are you have a readily accessible population that's online. Um, the, cost per survey tends to be quite low, um, particularly rel uh, relative to other ways of doing online experiments or especially uh, compared to a lab experiment or a telephone survey or especially uh, an in-person type of survey. And um, the beauty of it is you can get a large number of responses in a very short time, literally hundreds or thousands of responses in just a few hours. Um, some of the widely discussed disadvantages are you're, you're dealing with a unique population of people um, these are people that are online that are sort of professional survey takers, but we also find when we look at the demographics of people that participate that there's a lot of variation in terms of age and gender and education level in the people who respond to our ads. Um, the quality of the responses tend to be quite high. We have very few and complete surveys. When we've done open-ended responses, uh, there's very little sort of gibberish. It does seem like uh, in some ways this disadvantage can also be an advantage. Um, there's no way to really monitor subjects, so you don't know if their attention is divided, <clears throat> but I will talk about some quality checks that we do in that regard. Um, and then also people have discussed that um, some, some people on Amazon Mechanical Turk use VPNs that misrepresent their location. Um, we, we try to screen out ineligible subjects in two ways. The first way is with our ad on Mechanical Turk. So we look for the highest quality um, uh, Turkers, as they're called, or in Turk. Uh, workers. Um, so we will only allow people that have an approval rating of 95% on Mechanical Turk. So people that are known for putting forth effort and taking the task seriously. And then we also restrict our location to the United States since we're concerned with US law. Um, once, the, um, once the people who responded to our Mechanical Turk ad go to our Qualtrics 
instrument. We also build in some, some ways to, um, to make some subjects ineligible. For example, we did a response time experiment with our dilution project in which we only wanted people that were using a laptop or a desktop to participate. We didn't want uh, people that were using mobile devices. So we set up front, no mobile devices are allowed. But then within Qualtrics, we had a branch um, that ended the survey for people who were using a mobile device. We can also set location parameters to make people ineligible if they're not within a particular uh, location. Um, Qualtrics has a prevent ballot stuffing um, option where you can prevent multiple submissions so that people can't keep taking the survey over and over and continue to get paid. Um, and we also include uh, screening questions. If you go to the next slide, the screening questions are very uh, important for narrowing down uh, your group from people that may not have the kind of knowledge of the product categories or the types of products uh, that you're doing a, uh, a sort of an IP related experiment on. For example, we did for our confusion project, we were looking at uh, salty snacks. And so in replicating actually a survey that was used in litigation, we use the same screening questions, asking people if they've purchased salty snacks and uh, if they plan to purchase salty snacks. <clears throat> and if they answered uh, no to one of these questions, we labeled them as a fail or ineligible. Um, and Barton, if you could go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> a key is to not just end the survey for these folks because it, it uh, maybe they could tell their friends or post something online saying, hey, if you don't answer these questions a certain way, you won't get credit for the survey, you won't get paid. So actually we would just send them to a dummy survey. It would actually be basically like the same exact survey that we presented to folks who were eligible and we would pay these people. Um, so they would go through each section of the survey and then the survey would end, but they would be labeled as a fail. And, and the important thing here is to make sure that your ineligible subjects don't get included in the pool of people that you're gonna randomize to treatment and control group. So, we're always making sure that we have up front a, uh, a system for weeding the people out who are ineligible. So in the next slide, um, we will then, Qualtrics has a, a really nice survey flow option and a randomizer tool. And so for those who make it through and are eligible, we'll randomly assign them to a treatment or a control group or in our um, confusion paper, it was a little different. We had three different groups um, so group one, group two, group three, and uh, the people there were seeing different versions of our survey. Um, and so in the end, next slide, please. Um, you're going to create branches in the survey to make sure that um, you're showing the correct version of the survey to your treatment or your control group or your different groups. And uh, the idea here really is, uh, you know, basically the, the logic of random assignment that you're going to end up with groups that are the same or very similar on all variables except for the treatment and or the stimulus that that you're you're showing. So, for example, in our um, confusion paper, uh, the answer choice setup was the difference that uh, that people saw. Or in some of our uh, dilution papers, people in the treatment group would see a particular type of ad that people in the control group didn't. Otherwise, the setup of the survey was completely the same. So uh, next slide, please. Um, we make sure to pilot our surveys on small samples before we run them. Um, the idea here is like a survey pretest. You wanna uh, identify technical problems with uh, wording and the survey logic, but we've also found piloting to be just an essential part of our process. Um, it's often how we learn and how we develop hypotheses that we hadn't thought of. Um, this was particularly the case in our dilution project where we were replicating the type of uh, response time surveys that were very common in the social science literature. And when we ran our pilot, we found that there was this surprise effect happening uh, when people would see the, um, the diluting ad and that, uh, that previous experiments weren't including the proper control. And so we adjusted our approach in sort of iterative fashion to include the right kind of control so that we could measure the effect of the diluting ad. Um, one thing that we always keep in mind is to make sure that those who participate in our pilots don't end up taking the final survey because they'll be familiar with it. They might be able to guess the hypothesis. And a way that we do this is with the Mechanical Turk ID. This is a unique 
long ID that each Mechanical Turk <clears throat> participant has, and it's essentially how they get paid. So we'll match our records against um, the pilots um, to make sure that if this Mechanical Turk uh, number has been used, um, that we let them know, you know, kindly, thank you for taking, you know, the survey, but you, you've already participated once before and you can't take it again. And then summing up, there's just a number of quality checks that we try to do both within the survey <clears throat> itself. And then at the end, if there's one more slide um, that mentions these. Uh, we'll include a question, an attention uh, check question is a kind of attempt to monitor um, uh, the, the, the survey takers. So you can see this question it has this really long prompt. And if you're just breezing through the survey really fast, um, you'll see that the question is, what's your favorite color? And you might just click one of the buttons. But really, the prompt says, go down to the other button and write in teal. And that's how we know that the person was paying attention. We'll look at our data later. And we find that actually very few people um, aren't paying attention. But this is a good way to, to, uh, to take uh, subjects out after the fact in the data analysis phase. We'll also check metadata for prohibited devices. And then we'll check our our data for repeat responders who somehow made it through the other ways that we try to prevent repeat responders by looking at duplicate um, mechanical Turk ID numbers or duplicate IP addresses. And that's it. We actually didn't plan a conclusion. Um, I'll just butt in and say um, that uh, I hope you find that informative as just a, a quick description of our trademark specific project the many projects Chris has done and uh, this really helpful information from Roy uh, giving you a sense of, um, you know, the details of actually implementing this stuff. And now I guess we're excited for any questions or answers, uh, especially Joel, um, or Joel can insert any corrections or follow up certainly, uh, because we're pretty much on time, uh, remarkably, and I'll stop sharing screen. Yeah, we have, we, we are, we are very punching it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Very inspiring, creative, and also integrates a lot of different uh, empirical research on IP law. Uh, so do we have questions? Chris, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for the presentation, uh, everybody. Um, I enjoy, uh, always enjoy discussing this work. It's a important part of work that we're doing at, at CREATE and, and now at the University of Leeds, where I actually use your paper on sequential creativity in my um, undergraduate methods class when we talk about experiments. Um, but another thing that we, we focus on at Leeds and we're focusing on it with new work is sort of, let's say, particularities um, drilling down into the cultural and productive differences between um, creative industries. And one of the interesting things, of course, we talk about in the methods class is, um, uh, what is it, e external validity, right? And um, I'm sure all of our shared frustration that it's difficult to capture a creative labor of love in a 30 seconds or even a five minute or 20 minute um, activity, right? Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment is explore how might these sequential creative um, incentives as you, you call them in the paper differ between different uh, mediums. So if we imagine a computer game versus a work of literature, for the borrower, it may be easier to um, uh, get a subsidy by borrowing for a work of literature where they can just copy the text across and paste and publish the book, right? Whereas in a computer game, because you have you know, all of the creative and production practices of making a game, 3D modeling, and code and all that, the actual incentive to borrow may be lower because the rewards are lower in that, in that industry. So I, I guess my question is, and, and this also uh, relates a little bit to the trademark work too, where you have obviously you have people who are familiar with the good versus people who are unfamiliar with the good. You have um, perhaps differences when it comes to different creative practices. 
So are you interested in refining your experimental approach to deal with um, idiosyncrasies and differences between subgroups of people who are either more or less familiar with the particular art form or the particular product or um, folk musicians versus electronic musicians and those kinds of questions. Um, I'd love to talk to you guys more about, about how to maybe integrate the study of, of real practical creative industry work with, with your exciting experimental approach. Thanks. Yeah. So ecological validity is always, for every experiment, it's always a major question. But let me just back up for a second and say that every form of empirical inquiry has a major question and every form of non-empirical inquiry has at least one major question attached to it. So ecological validity is really one of the major questions attached to experiments. So if, if we weren't doing experiments and we were doing um, kind of natural experiments based on data, right? D data, we weren't doing lab experiments, but we were collecting data. The, 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 the question always attached to that as well, the data that you're collecting is never precisely about the thing you're studying. And so you have to do all kinds of manipulations in order to make that data tell the story that you think it would tell about the question you're interested in. And that of course pre presents its own set of problems. And if, if, if you're just, you know, if you're looking at cases and you're, you're doing an empirical paper based on what cases say, then there's always the question of like, well, how are you coding it and how much interpretation um, is packed into your coding decisions and how sensitive are your results to those interpretations. So, so every form of inquiry is gonna come with some question like this packed into it. So ecological validity. So some, some experiments have like really difficult ecological validity problems and some don't. So let me give you an example of one that doesn't. So the, the one that Barton talked about doesn't, why? Because we are in a weird way studying people being experimented on, right? So when, when, when someone does a trademark survey in a litigation, it's basically an experiment. And what we're doing is studying the way people do experiments. So, you know, the ecological validity concern goes away a little bit because we are very closely replicating the ecology. We're not precisely replicating it, but we're, we're replicating it much more closely than a typical study does. Okay, that, then we talk about stuff like, um, sequential creativity studies that you refer to. So those have much more serious ecological validity problems, right? Why is that? Because we're studying people who are who are doing something that they don't do for a living. They're, they're playing a, a certain kind of creativity game that they don't do professionally. Um, they, they probably don't, you know, do this kind of stuff at all. Um, they're, they're being asked to do it under some kind of laboratory conditions, right? So there's there's like demand effects potentially that we have to worry about. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of those things. And so we try our best to deal with those and to make, to, to, to control, for example, to ask questions carefully so that we, we don't create unusual demand effects and to make our claims, to modulate our claims, you know, so that we can, you know, explain what the ecological validity concerns are and so people can take account of them. But I will say that, you know, we're always interested in attacking the ecological validity problems, but I'm also interested in make, making sure people understand that experimental methods are incredibly valuable, but you will never in the social sciences anyway, sometimes in the natural sciences, yes, you will, but in the social sciences, you won't get a complete answer from an experiment. You'll get important evidence from an experiment, but that evidence has to be combined with other kinds of evidence before you feel like you really know something, right? So yes, I would like, for example, based on um, our experiments about sequential creativity, I'd like to do some qualitative empirical work, talking to creators and seeing if some of these things resonate with them. That, that's, that's for sure one of the things that people who really do great qualitative work could do that would be complementary to these more lab-based um, projects. So let me um, just add something to what Chris said. Um, <clears throat> you know, you always have this trade-off between internal validity and ecological validity. Yeah. Um, and it's also the difference between saying what could happen or what might happen or what should happen and what will happen. You'll never be able to get a study that will tell you what will happen. So at least my view is always that you, you sacrifice ecological validity for internal validity or the integrity of the experiment. But that doesn't mean that you have to eliminate it altogether. Now, I, I, I've never 
done um, uh, a study in things like sequential creativity, but I did studies on smoking um, that have some elements that might be useful in, in the context that you're thinking about. So you study, uh, uh, um, if I studied smokers um, who are maybe taking the study in a facility in which you can't smoke or maybe have stopped smoking, um, what, what I do is I warm them up by asking a whole battery of questions that relate to what they do when they smoke. When's your first cigarette of the day, um, et cetera, things of that, to at least move their frame of mind towards a position where they're actually getting closer to the experience that you're asking them about that you can't feasibly test about. You're, you're, react, you're, you're, re, you're reactivating their addiction. That's right. Possibly. That's right. Oh. That's right. And hopefully they don't start smoking again. Exactly. Yeah, but it's a really great question. And, you know, it's it, I mean, one of the things that I've tried to do in the past is to get qualitative empiricists interested in this work because that's a whole nother set of skills, a really valuable set of skills. And um, it could, you know, if you, if you do qualitative work that testing experimental results, often you get really interesting messages about heterogeneity that the experiment has a hard time picking up. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, sure. maybe I'm gonna send you guys a preprint. Great. We'll carry on the conversation. See you. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Kuhu Tivari. Um, hello, good morning, one and all. My name is Kuhu. I am from India. And uh, I'm, I'm pursuing my PhD in interdisciplinary area of trademark and pharmaceuticals. This is a very basic question that I'm going to ask because I'm a very new researcher in this. So basically, I'm conducting an empirical study to understand the consumer's perception in Indian market regarding branded genetics, branded drug, and generic drugs. How they perceive it, do, do they even know the distinction between these, how they perceive the trade dress. So, so far I have spoken to the uh, experts in economics. They have told me that the population of India is like in billion. And if you want to collect data, you should target at least for 1,500 data uh, set regarding consumers. But I'm actually very confused if I'll be able to justify my research because now their answers, consumers answer will be evaluated against the answers received by medical practitioners and pharmacists. So this is my question. How should I perceive this? I'm very confused. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say. I'll start. Um, you know, I, I, I think that guidelines such as the ones you're reporting are, are frankly silly. Um, to say just one, start with 1,500 uh, respondents. You know, the number of respondents that really depends on the heterogeneity of the underlying population. If there was no heterogeneity, you'd only need one respondent. Um, and you know, there are um, relatively few. You know, uh, well, let me put it this way. I I'll give you an example that I give to my class. Um, yeah, the, the notion that the larger the population, the more respondents you need uh, is not accurate. So I talked to my class about, uh, my mother used to like to make vichyssoise and she might make a whole big giant vat, um, one that's as big as the room I'm in. Uh, or she might just make a small pot. If I take one drop of that vichyssoise, then I might not know whether I like it or not. 
But if I take two or three spoonfuls, I'll know whether I like it. And that's independent of how big the vat is. So the question that you need to ask that seems to be missing from the guidelines that you're given is how heterogeneous, how heterogeneous the underlying population is. Um, and that's the, that's the critical factor, not the size of the population that you're drawing from. Yeah, and trying to figure that out, it might be helpful, depending on the questions you're planning to ask, the specific questions, it might be helpful to see if people have asked questions like this in the past and you know, how, how, how much variation there was in the responses. Or if there aren't previous studies that are close enough to your question, where you can say, oh, I expect about the same heterogeneity, you run a pilot and yeah. you, you try to figure out how much heterogeneity you're likely to find when you do a full sample and you, you then calculate, you know, in order to get an effect, if there is an effect to be found, because sometimes there's not, but if there is an effect to be found, how big of a population am I gonna need with this level of heterogeneity that I'm seeing in a pilot to actually see the effect at a, at a good solid level of significance, of, of, of statistical significance, how many people will I need to produce that? I mean, that's, you know, if, if you think there's an effect, um, there are ways of estimating based on a pilot's variability, how, how big a sample you're gonna need. Yeah, similar to Joel and Chris, I think that you could consult a, um, a statistics uh, textbook on a chapter on power analysis. Yeah. And, um, you have to have some idea of what your outcome variable is and whether it's conducting a pilot or finding some other data set, uh, looking at the mean and the standard deviation of that and uh, creating uh, groups and, and testing for statistical power. Um, and also having some understanding of what you would consider an effect. That's sort of a more subjective task, but what would constitute effect? And if, and if there is such an effect, how many people with that level of variability do you, do you need to actually see it in an experimental setting? Yeah. I, I have a less sophisticated contribution and which is, I guess it's, it's not as satisfying to try to focus on one particular area of India, like one particular state um, where, because you would like to, I assume, generalize about India uh, in your conclusions, but maybe, um, to start, you just focus on, you know, Kerala or Delhi or uh, Uttar Pradesh or something like that. Although well, that place is enormous, but in any case, maybe focusing in uh, it, it as an aspect of a pilot study might be great. Though the mechanics of that, I realize, might be complicated when you're dealing with people online. Thank you so much. This is very helpful for me, and this was a very great session. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kufu Tiwari. That's a very good question. And thank you for all speakers' uh, comments on that. Uh, now we have uh, Chris. You have a question, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Uh, yes, it's Kat, it's Craig. Nice to see you, those of you I know. And thanks for including me. Um, sorry, I couldn't change my name on the thing. I don't know. <laughs> um, so I have, I mean, I don't know if these are really. Um, sort of fair questions, but just reflections. I tend not to do the empirical work myself. I'm always interested and intrigued by, by how it's done and by what it means, but I consider myself sort of as a starting point, a bit of a, of a skeptic in terms of what we sort of take away from it and, and what it contributes to the policy debates or the sort of operation of the law. Um, and so maybe I could come at it from a couple of angles. I think maybe just first on the trademarks paper, which um, I read again, um, for today, I was just, uh, first of all, I think this is a terrific contribution and clearly something that's needed in sort of trademark litigation in many jurisdictions, in Canada for one. Um, I think we're sort of in between the UK and the US and Canada right now. We also have like the masterpiece ruling from 2011, which was a Supreme Court case where the, the court was very sort of skeptical about the expert evidence it was presented with, which really did more to confuse the issues than it did to elucidate anything. 
And um, really everybody got a big sort of slap on the wrist for that. And the sense was amongst trademark litigants and practitioners that they that basically evidence was off the table, expert evidence was off the table, survey evidence had to be very, very carefully constructed. Over the last 10 years or so, we've seen that I think that is the case that the courts are more willing uh, um, to act as gatekeepers on what gets in to a sort of consideration um, for the trier of fact and, you know, a, a sort of reliability, um, maybe replicability, but certainly validity criteria, right? Like you, what questions are you asking? Was it the relevant universe and so on? And, and if it doesn't satisfy us, we don't just let it in as a sort of a weight on the scale, we actually will right. exclude it, you know, initially. And so I think that has changed the landscape. Um, but because there's still this receptivity to, um, to certainly survey data, I think that means that a more nuanced, more carefully thought out, more sort of sophisticated approach to conducting those surveys and to analyzing the data that comes out of it would land really well. And so, you know, I'm going to bring this to the attention of people um, in Canada as well who, who do this work on the ground. And hopefully I think it could have some, um, some real traction. So that's the good part. And then I get to kind of some of my, my questions about it. I mean, obviously the um, reliability, replicability issue is a huge one in you know, social sciences generally. So I take the point that it doesn't need to be visited um, on your um, shoulders specifically. I was going to say about um, the Canadian context that one of the complications for marks that are not used and for this sort of simulation of um, context is that you need to be able to simulate imperfect recollection of a mark because the test for confusion is a mark that you know is not perfectly um, recalled by the consumer. And so that's the existing challenge for unused marks in the Canadian context. And it's gonna become much more important as of course we have many more unused marks now that we don't require use for trademark registration. So just sort of flagging that as an interesting empirical question that I have no capacity to answer, but hopefully someone does. Um, and you might have thoughts on how that could actually be achieved in an effective way. My concerns are a bit more about things like sort of diversity and context um, and all of those usual sort of the ecology of the, the questions. But I think one more added layer to that for me is not just the sort of diversity in terms of respondents, but bearing in mind, like maybe a more complicated understanding of the subject of the consumer of the person in their lives and where and how they make different decisions or respond to different um, stimuli at different times and in different roles. You know, in the in the copyright context, especially, are you asking someone as a consumer or as a creator, as an author? Um, are you asking someone as an employee or an employer? And I think that changes the way that one single person could respond to the very same question in different ways and different roles. And I never really see that sort of notion of shifting subjectivities or intersectionality play into the construction of these um, experiments. So just a thought. The other one is bigger and I'm sure, I don't know Barton if we've had this conversation, I think I've had it with Mark McKenna, I know I've had it with Chris Buckabisco in the, in the copyright context. But the accusation I think that always strikes me as quite profound here is that the empirical projects sort of take you know, we take trademark law on its word that it cares about consumers and whether they're actually confused in the marketplace. So, you know, we're, we're taking copyright on this word that it's actually trying to incentivize people to actually create things in their life. And, you know, that in itself is a huge leap, right? And, I, you know, I think when you talk about the sort of binary of confused, not confused, you know, um, and why that makes the survey problematic, for trademark law purposes, it makes it perfect, right? Because the law is on off. Do you own it? Do you not own it? Is it infringed? Is it not infringed? Is it public? Is it private? And so the fact that the simplicity of what we do sort of overlays this, the way that the law works reflects the fact that, you know, trademark law, I would say, doesn't really care if consumers are confused, right? So then the question, I guess, for you is like, are you what's the next thing? Is it that it should and you think it will and you, it will rise to this challenge and you know then sort of adopt your perspective or is it more just that you want to catch it out? You want to prove that it doesn't care how the world actually works. Um, are we trying to hold the system to account on its own terms or are we trying to reveal that, um, that none of this has got anything to do with real people in the real world? Um, just your thoughts on that. Okay, thank you.
Thanks, Jay. Martin, you want to start with this, or? Yeah, it's, I guess I'll I'll start um, very briefly. I can't possibly do justice to the richness of uh, some of the points you are making, um, and so I'll just maybe um, touch upon a few of them. Um, I was really struck by the reference to intersectionality and uh, diversity and context for consumers and the to various roles they would play. And regrettably, um, my co-authors can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I we haven't focused on that. We've we went in that direction a little bit. We wanted to um, ask about the political uh, ideology of people and see how that would affect um, some of the answers they would give um, to, uh, to, to survey questions, maybe affecting their level of sophistication. Um, but um, we didn't publish those results. And to be honest, I'm not sure we, I, I can't recall precisely what results we got along those uh, lines. But that's just a sort of uh, meandering way to say, yes, that's really important. And we would love to, I think, to uh, get a little more specific on issues uh, uh, like that. As far as, and I also won't be able to do justice to the third point, um, what is trademark law really uh, doing? It, does it care about consumer confusion? I think actually, I would answer that it should care and uh, if only if we accept trademark law, sort of mainstream trademark law as being about competition and efficient competition. Um, I'd like to think of trademark law as basically a form of competition policy that also has some free speech elements to it and cultural elements to it. But let's go ahead and say it's about competition policy, then trademark law should care about actual consumer perception and base its rulings um, on consumer perception, especially in light of Maybe this is what others, uh, my co-authors are thinking of. Um, there might be 20% of consumers who are confused, but what about the other, uh, let's say 70% who are not confused, and we're leaving aside 10% who are unsure? Uh, are we gonna change the law based on the minority who are confused when 70% are actually relying um, on uh, the trademark and relying correctly uh, on the trademark? Um, I think those are um, questions going to economic efficiency, but even more importantly, maybe they're basically political questions about uh, how we form a just society, if you want to get sort of fancy about it, but I think trademark law uh, implicates them, because after all, these are consumers, also voters, we're talking about voting uh, for uh, products, so that's, sorry, I don't have more specific answers for you, but yes, these are very uh, interesting uh, questions to pursue. One thing that I would add to that, I agree with Barton that um, trademark law should care about consumer confusion for, for all the competition policy reasons he mentions. I'm also a little, I'm, I guess I'm cynical enough to think that um, sometimes it's good to take the law on its own terms, especially if those terms don't wash out the way that they are supposed to. So, so if people say, well, the law is meant to do this and you say, well, it doesn't actually do that very well, you'd have to change the way you do trademark litigation to have trademark actually inquire meaningfully into consumer confusion. It's interesting to watch what people's reaction is. So, you know, we did our dilution paper and our dilution paper basically was, well, you know, th these ways of showing dilution aren't, they don't have construct validity. Here's a way of showing dilution that could have construct validity. And, you know, we got some pushback from some people who are like, well, that's, you know, we, we do it the way we do it because, you know, we, we can at least show something. Um, now, this is a little bit like when, when you say, okay, so the UK really rejects trademark evidence and, you know, the, Canada occasionally does too. And I kind of want to say it's only lawyers who think they have the luxury of doing that. Like physicists don't think they have the luxury of, 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 of rejecting gravity evidence just because they don't understand how gravity acts instantaneously at a distance. They don't, no one says, well, we have to reject gravity evidence because it doesn't make any sense to us. I think this is the thing about lawyers that I hate and is, is endemic, which is this arrogance about you know, knowing things, you know, when Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts says, you know, sociology is all gobbledygook, this, this is exactly it from the top. Um, so my, my view of trademark law is if it cannot be after like a period of time, very careful study, if we can't figure out how to do the empirics of trademark, then maybe we shouldn't do it. You know, maybe we shouldn't just like have weak tests like the Polaroid analysis where we're looking at a bunch of proxies and 
judges are kind of making guesses because they're 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 a real interest at stake. Like Barton says, you know, what if seventy percent of people are not confused, and now we're requiring them to reconstruct associations um, on something they're unfamiliar with? That's a real cost. Um, typically, we don't require people to engage in that kind of costly behavior unless there's a real reason to. So we'll see. Um, one other note, and I'll just say it quickly, you know, this so-called replication crisis, we had a moment in the dilution paper, which, which preceded the paper that Barton talked about today, where I, I think I got some insight into the replication crisis. Often it's difficult to replicate experiments because, not because the experiments are bad, but because the way they're reported is bad. So often to replicate an experiment, you've got to get every detail right. You've, you've got to get every detail of how things are presented to subjects, in what order they're presented, how long they're presented. You, you, the choreography is like very often detailed. And usually when these experiments are written up, the, the fine details are actually not written up because it would take forever. And so, you know, we, when we were trying to replicate an experiment in the dilution paper, we're on the phone with the experimenters who did an experiment, what, Barton, like 20 years ago, 15 years ago? And we're asking them about fine details of how like tombstone ads were presented to, um, you know, to, to subjects. And um, I bet you stuff like that happens again and again and again in social science. And it, it's not so much a crisis of replication. It's a little bit more subtle than that. It's a crisis of writing shit down which often doesn't get done. And that's why, you know, thank you. I bet. Well, yeah. well, thank you. I'm sorry, let me interrupt for a while. Uh, I, I will quickly forecast in the next semester. And everyone, if you want to stay for the conversation, please, as you wish. So I will quickly uh, forecast it. Like this is the last uh, seminar for this sem semester. And we are delightedly to confirm speakers from uh, for next semester, for Professor uh, Aurin Fratcher from the University of Texas for trademark history. And for our innovative methodologies on trademark, we will have Professor Florent Thorin and uh, Danny Geber Professor Tilman Altwicker from University of Zurich uh, to present their empirical research on trademark compositions in Switzerland. The paper has already been published on the Journal of European International and IP Law. Everyone who received the uh, Zoom link is on the mailing list and you will receive the details about these talks for the next semester. So uh, if you want to stay, uh, continue the conversation, please. And if you have to leave, uh, then you can, uh, you're can. you free to go. And uh, I will say thank you very much for all speakers today and all attendees. Appreciate it. That's a lovely and creative, productive conversation. Thank you.